Hi, I'm Mrs. Jolly E. I'm coming from my home studio here, and I'm going to talk you through some things that regard your drawing unit. I'm going to start you off with your pencils. I know there's some vocabulary in the PowerPoint and reasons why we draw. Those things you can cover in the PowerPoint with your teacher. But today, I want to spend some time discussing, more importantly, the 2H and 4B pencils. Notice on your pencils, you have markings with letters and numbers. The H and B are explained in the PowerPoint as well, but I really want to address what the numbers mean. When you were in grade school or middle school, you might remember doing an integer scale. Zero would be the center. You might have negative numbers on the left, positive numbers on the right. If I look at this scale in terms of B as soft or dark pencils and H as hard or light pencils, that's going to help me understand how a 4B pencil and a 2H pencil relate. So again, our B and our H are going to refer to the, the pencil lead, the hardness or softness of the lead. If I use my 4B pencil and I make a few marks, I'm going to notice that they're very dark. They're also crumbly on the edges. If I make some marks with my 2H pencil, I'm going to notice that this value is much lighter and the pencil keeps a more even line. I don't have as much shift and variation in the thickness of the line. I have a standard pencil that often we use for taking I-step tests or other things like that. This is a HB pencil. Also, you'll see some like this that are called a 2B pencil. You'll need a number 2B pencil for this test. Those we're going to look at in the middle range. So I'm going to use my standard, this is a Ticonderoga Dixon Ticonderoga HB pencil. HB kind of is like my zero. It sort of sits in the middle of my pencil range. If my B's are on the left side, this would be like saying 1B, 2B, 3B, and then guess where this 4B pencil is going to go? He's going to go way out here. So my 4B pencil increasingly gets darker as it gets away from my HB location. And my lead is going to get softer as I get away from my middle HB level. The 2H runs the opposite direction. This would be like a 1H, a 2H, a 3H, a 4H. Now we have the 2H pencil, so it's going to drop in right around there. I'm going to notice that the hardness of the pencil, it feels a lot harder than my 4B pencil does as I write or draw on my paper. It's also going to stay very light. If I wanted to sketch, I can do that very lightly with this pencil and it still will erase very well. As I think about this value scale on my Unit 1 Drawing Camp, I might consider the fact that light, this box is going to be a white of the paper number one level value. I might use my 2H pencil to work these two boxes. I might use my 4B pencil to work these two or three boxes. 
and I might mix my HB pencil into my 2H and 4B to do the three in the middle. So let's talk about using pencils. Most of us want to hold a pencil with a traditional grip where we use what's called a tripod grip. We're anchoring our hand through the table, holding and choking the pencil up tight at the tip of the pencil. I would like to encourage you to start trying to back off of the pencil. If I hold the pencil at the heel end of the pencil, I can make the pencil much more flat to the paper. I even try to hold mine a little bit more over the top or just with my two fingers. And as I start to put a value into this 2H level two value right here, I can kind of control that a little bit more to stay very, very light and very even. So I'm going to make this a little bit darker to make sure that it picks up on my camera. But I'll show you how you can lighten that in just a few minutes. So each of these values, I'm trying to progressively get darker and darker as I do my shading for each value box. I don't want to run my pencil through the whole box trying to work this way. I want to keep each box as its own separate value or separate shape that I'm trying to control edge to edge and get darker and darker. Now here's where I was talking about, I may want to use the 2H pencil, but I might also want to put a little bit of my HB pencil. So this is about as dark as I'm gonna get with keeping a nice texture to the 2H. So now I'm gonna come in Again, notice I'm holding my pencil way at the back so that I can kind of control how much pressure I have on it and I can keep my pressure pretty light. But this is gonna let me just kind of layer in a little bit on top so that I can get my darkness under control and I can keep my textures somewhat even. So what I want you to think about doing, whoop, wrong one, 4B. My dark, I want to make this last step as dark as possible, but also as flat as possible. I'm working on a wood surface. I'm starting to pick up my wood texture, even though I put a sheet of paper underneath my paper I'm doing my value scale on. I'm starting to pick up a little bit of that wood grain from under there. So I want my darkest dark to be that dark. I'm going to increment, maybe keep it on the lighter side. It's much easier to, to go darker than it is to go lighter if you've gone too dark. So right now, this is too big of a jump. But if I come in, I'm gonna change direction to help me fill some of those gaps that maybe I'm missing because of my line stroke. And now I can kind of control it. So I'm looking for an even step to coming out and transitioning value to value. And we'll give you some time to work on this. So while you're working on, on that a little bit, I'd also like to, to talk about what happens if you get something a little bit too close. Or maybe you made it a little bit too dark, like this jump right now when I look on the camera is looking a little bit, bit bigger than maybe I want it to be. Another tool that's in your art packet is this fun kneaded eraser. So it might look like silly putty to you. It might uh, feel like something that you can play and make sculptures with, but I'm going to warm up this eraser, stretch it. And when I stretch it, that folds the dirty sides. I've used this one a few times already. Folds up the dirty graphite filled parts and kind of cleans it and gives me a new surface to work with. 
So all I'm going to do, I'm not going to rub with this eraser. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tap with this eraser. So if I come in, I'm going to go in that darker spot. So maybe you can see my holes that I'm tapping off. So let me try it down here. It usually works best for everybody to understand it if I come in and pull from here. So see that blob I just took out? That's now on my eraser. So if you get something a little bit too dark and you want to take off some of your graphite, stretch your kneaded eraser around, kind of lightly tap or pick at that surface to pull that graphite away. Okay. So we're looking for a nice even transition from white and slowly building our steps to get darker as you go to finish this value scale. Drawing techniques on the cube. As we come down into this under spot on your first page, what we're looking for you to do is utilize each of these drawing techniques to model one of these cubes. So hatching, you have a great image on your PowerPoint with hatching. Keep in mind, I don't have to just use lines. I can also change the weight of my lines. I could change the pencil that I'm going to use. So let's say there's a shadow maybe coming off of this box. I may use hatching and my 4B pencil to create those hatch marks. Hatch marks are going to go directional. We'll follow them through. If this side is lighter, maybe I use my 2H. I'm going to do a little bit of hatching so that this looks just a little bit darker than the top surface. Um, maybe I use the HB and I'm going to do straight lines for my hatching. Maybe with a little bit more pressure so I can build up a medium dark in here. Cross hatching, I think you'll, you'll see that one from the handout. I'm literally taking the same idea with the lines, but I'm going to let the lines crisscross over each other to build up my darks. Stippling is kind of a noisy one. With stippling, I'm going to kind of build this same sense of value, but this time I'm going to be using dots. I don't know if you can hear that. Uh, stippling comes in handy if you're working in pen or marker and you're trying to build an area of dark but control the gradation of the value from light to dark, like this value scale, stippling's kind of a fun one to do in those media, pen and marker. Scumbling. Scumbling, we have a nice illustration again on your handout. With scumbling, I'm going to be doing little rotations little circles, but I'm going to keep the little circles in a tight, tight pattern. The darker I press, the darker the scumbling lines are going to be. I can let my pressure lighten up as I make my lines if I wanted to have a slight gradation of value. Um, here I'm just using the HB pencil. The more lines I layer, the darker it's going to look. Uh, but the scumbling, why would you ever want to use that? You may want to have a texture, maybe it's uh, trees or carpet or something that's got a ton of textural quality to it. Scumbling can be a nice way to create a texture while you're also creating a sense of value with a stick media. Scumbling is pretty popular with pen. Um, some people use it with pencil for textures. It looks really awesome with the pen because of the contrast between dark and light. So this is scumbling. This is my stipple that I didn't really finish, but I think you get the idea.
you can take time to finish that one. This is hatching. Again, hatching all the same direction. Cross hatching. I'm going to vary. Some strokes are going to go one direction. Some strokes are going to go the opposite direction to help me build my darks, okay? The last cube I wanna talk about is tonal modeling. So when we get into modeling, what I want you to think about is maybe going back to that grip that I talked about with the pencils, where you can kind of control how much pressure is on the pencil. And here again, I may wanna stay in a specific direction as I start to fill an area with some value. So here I'm using my HB. I could use my 2H here. Maybe it depending upon my light source, I wanna throw a little bit of the, the 2H on top. And I might go the opposite direction to help me kind of fill any of my little negative voids that I sometimes have. Come in with my 4B. Maybe I want my light source to be on the left so it's shining on the top of my cube. But I'm getting mostly shadow on this side. And then if I wanted to do that cast shadow, this is where I may have a little more pressure. Start it from the edge of the cube and make sure I've got a nice edge that mimics the top. So tonal modeling is going to be what most of us called shading in middle school, where we're seeing a nice transition of light to dark with an even flatness, a flat quality in our values. So it's taking this value scale and it's putting it within this cube. More on that with the sphere. In this drawing unit, we will take time to talk a little bit about cylindrical objects and spherical objects. So we will be modeling this sphere. Remember that's using my full range, my nine step value scale, and we will be modeling a cylinder. One form that we want to talk about with the cylinder, or I should say shape rather, is going to be an ellipse. An ellipse is basically a circle that's been tilted or foreshortened in my view. So if I think about the side of this object, this is a cylindrical based object. It's much like a toilet paper tube or anything like a can, right? Even with its lid. We know the top down, it's going to be a circle. And we know from the sides, if the lid was flat, I'd look more like this. I'd have like a straight line coming down, right? So what happens to my circle? When I look at an object in space, if I set this down on the table and did not have my camera pointing straight down, I would see maybe a little bit of the top of this, where the table hits it. If I'm trying to represent this in a drawing, I need to think about the fact that my circle, my circle is foreshortened. I've tilted it, okay? So the shape that this starts to become, here's my overhead view, it's going to start to become an ellipse, an ellipse, an ellipse, an ellipse, an ellipse, an ellipse. See that little tiny, tiny thin zone right there? That still is an ellipse. Often students want to call these an oval. Please keep in mind an oval and an ellipse are a completely different thing. If I saw this little thin circular form right here, most of us would not call that an oval. We would want to name it something else. And that's where the term ellipse comes in. So in this exercise on the left, I want you to think about how circles would fit inside of squares. Okay, if I could arc and continually arc so that I only hit 
the center of each side of that midline to my square, I would have a nice circle. If I start to tilt my square, if I took a square form like this coaster, watch the front and the back. If I start to tilt this, the front part is coming closer to the camera it's going to get longer or wider. The back part that's going away from the camera is going to appear shorter or not as long left and right. Same difference with that circle. If the circle is gonna tilt, I'm going to see it in a new view. So as I tilt that back, this front end looks and appears to be longer in size than the end that's in the back. Okay, that's what these illustrations are about. So here, what I want you to try to do is create a curved, rounded shape. You may have to do over and over and over and over again to get into that rounded form and find it. But here we're trying to start to close up our circle a little bit, hence I now have a trapezoid for the square. And here I'm going to get even tighter, so my trapezoid has more variation from the front line to the back line. And here I'm also going to try to curve and create the illusion of that circle over and over and over and over again until I find the one that I want. So I'm touching the center point of each of those square lines as that's tilted backwards. Here we're going to play around with a light source. If my light source is on the left, and if you can, maybe you'll be able to check this out in your classroom. If my light source is coming from the top left. It's going to create a shadow that goes to the right. Here I'm going to want to use a darker value. For that shadow. So this might be my 4B pencil with a whole lot of pressure if it's just the one spotlight shining on my cylinder. Now think about the properties of a cylinder. Often I get students that want to make these arcs on a rounded surface. If I took a spotlight and I shine it over here on the top right corner, notice that the values don't come down on my rounded surface on a diagonal. They come straight across. So we'll do this on the right side and then the left side too. So here's my light source. There we go. Note that the light is changing with the vertical structure. You can see it really well in the lid where that highlight is. Okay. If I do it on the left side, just like my diagram here, if I hold the, that lid down just a little bit, see how my wall is not, it's not curving on a, on a circular diagonal, it's going straight. So right there just above the writing where it says notice to parents, you'll see that that's coming down at, on a straight line, okay? So with that in play, I'm going to think about where that highlight started and where it was more shadowy. So I know I'm going to have some shadow on this side of my cylinder. The widest part of my cylinder is here. So I know from the middle to the right, I'm going to have a decent amount of dark. Now, because this is a fake light source, I may have more light through here. I may have light a little more to the left, but my chances are I'm going to have just ever so slightly a little tiny, tiny bit of value at the edge of my cylinder. 
and then it's going to lighten it's going to hit the reflected light and then it's going to slowly transition into that darker side of the cylinder so notice again i'm changing pencils i used my 4b for a while now i'm using the hb i might layer that in to that darker side and go from there okay if i get a little too heavy through here remember i can take that kneaded eraser clean that up and pull through to kind of make that nice little highlight edge the top depending upon what your top's doing if i'm getting a decent amount of light up here i may have some light that sort of hits the top i might find i've got just a little bit of like a level two value that might come to this other side Again, that's going to come out pretty flat. So if I turn over my, uh, try to position that where I had it before. I've got a little bit more light to the top left than I do to the top right. Um, but some other things that your teacher may want to talk with you about. If I have a, a dent in here, say this is like a toilet paper tube. When I start to put a light source on, notice my light is going to hit the interior right side of my cap so let's draw this like there's a hole in it if i have light coming from the left it's going to light this side up so i'm going to take that back out what it's not going to hit is the side where the light is so I'm gonna put some darker value here kind of like a champions logo the champions sportswear logo now depending upon how low or high my light is I may have a really severe cut from shadow casted shadow of this wall on the interior or i may have a little bit of a soft transition zone in there okay now i went out of my edge just a little bit so i'm going to clean that off and there's my cylinder okay now let's take what we learned here and apply that with some terms on the sphere and I know I'm missing a few things here, but I think you can get this vocabulary, all of this, off of your PowerPoint. Let's approach the sphere, modeling the sphere with pencils. Keep in mind, where is my light source? It's on the top left. So that's why I realized my casted shadow, hopefully you looked at your vocabulary, is going to be dark and on the opposite side of my light source, right? And what pencil am I going to use in this zone? I'm going to use my 4B pencil. Again, this may get very dark. I may want to take this if I had spotlights set up in the room. Um, I use a lot of spotlights in drawing class. So these shadows will get really good and dark. So I may want to choke up a little bit, but still do that over hand hold so that my pencil can make flat contact with the paper but I can get a nice, good, deep, dark shadow over here. So I've got my cast shadow. That's not so hard, right? Got a little smudgy. I'll fix that. Okay. When I think about a sphere and light hitting the sphere, my light's not going to hit flat and cut across. Do you remember talking about this Play-Doh container? And we talked about how the curvature is going to change the way the light is going to be represented in the drawing. It's not going to arc on a cylinder, but it will arc on a sphere. 
So with the sphere, let's think about the moon. I have a ping pong ball here. Now my lighting's going to look a little different because I'm showing my camera straight down, but in my image here, it's like I'm looking at the object. So if I take a, a light source and I kind of play around with its location, try to make it similar to what I'm lighting here, if I think about the moon and the sun hitting the moon to make the moon bright in the sky, often we start to see crescent shapes or rounded edges to the moon. That little sliver moon, a crescent moon. Um, sometimes we do see a half moon, um, but as we're, as we're kind of working, I want you to think about this rounded area of highlight here and how we start to see a crescent of shadow. If my light is more be coming from behind me, I'm going to see more light, a little bit thinner area of shadow. If I keep changing the position of the lighting, notice how my crescents start to change. Sometimes they're a severe shadow, sometimes they're going to be more light and less shadow. Okay, so hopefully that helps you kind of think about what we were looking at with this light source. I want to kind of think about a bullseye or rings on where my light source is hitting my object, in this case my sphere. So if the light is hitting the rounded surface, it's going to hit in a rounded spot. So something I like to have students do is just very lightly with the 2H pencil put kind of a rounded zone there. Almost like that's going to be the the center of a target, like a, a shooting target for archery. And then I'm going to have rings that kind of evolve out from that target. By thinking about those rings, let me do this with a little bit of a darker pencil. If I think about those rings that are going to evolve around that target, that's going to help me with my transitions of value from my value scale. So remember your value scale that you worked on, your white level one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine as your dark. That's what we want to try to acquire in our sphere study here. Okay. So if my, my light, my highlight where the light is hitting the, my spherical form is going to be white of the paper, that's my level one. And I want to leave that as white as possible, but next to it, I can start doing some modeling and I'm going to maybe make this a little bit darker one. So the camera will pick it up, but two, because I know if I keep a very soft pressure with my 2H pencil later, I can soften this with my kneaded eraser I can clean it and then I can tap out the edges of that transition. Okay. So I am going to start with a little bit of 2H pencil and then I'm going to softly transition that coming out. Some students like to start with a little bit of their 4B over here on the shadow side. That's fine. Start from your highlight, start from your shadow, wherever you feel most comfortable. But remember, you want to keep it a little bit light until you know it's right. This crescent shadow kind of like make again that sort of champions C logo, um, in this case backwards or upside down. I'm going to be a little bit wider through this zone, but then it's going to kind of crescent. It'll come to kind of a point at the top and the bottom. And then it's going to get just a little bit lighter as it transitions around from value to value. So I'm going to put just a little bit more 
4B with a very, very light weight. I might then transition to my HB pencil. Um, I may choose to do this whole thing with a 2H and a 4B. Honestly, if we can handle our pencils with pressure weights to help us with value, you could get by doing a whole drawing with just a 2H pencil and a 4B pencil and acquire a ton of values and have a nice range. So right now it's looking a little bit flat with maybe a little darker transition here. So I want to talk a little bit about form shadow, cast shadow, highlight. Um, we'll mention core and reflected light, but really highlight, form shadow, and cast shadow are the ones that we need you to know. If my light source is here and hitting the object, we already established where the highlight is. The object is blocking the light source, so that creates a cast shadow. So the form shadow. My form shadow is basically all of this value that comes in between my highlight and my cast shadow. Okay. Now, there's going to be a little bit of another term I want to explain called reflected light. And reflected light is sort of that minutia light that comes all around my object. Places where the object's not being blocked or is not physically blocking the light. So this object sort of looks like it's on a table, correct? There's going to be light hitting in front of my object and then bouncing. There's going to be light hitting behind my object and bouncing. There's going to be light hitting in different places around this form on the table surface. As light bounces, it's going to reflect a little bit of light. And so what happens is as light is hitting outside here, it's going to bounce at a 45 degree angle back up underneath the ball or sphere in this case. So I may end up with a little bit of a lighter shadow area right near my cast shadow and or the underside of the form that stays a little bit light. So I'm starting to kind of keep that zone right there a little bit lighter. Uh, to shape it, I may want to pinch my kneaded eraser up just a little bit and kind of tap through here, open that up a little bit if I wanted a little bit bigger space of reflected light. But it this zone is where some light that hits the table is going to bounce onto my sphere. Okay. There's a zone right next to it where no light can hit, no light bouncing can hit, no light coming from the light source can hit, and it's going to be the darkest part of the actual form shadow, so a subset of the form shadow. And this area right through here is called the core shadow. So it is the darkest part of, of a form's shadow where absolutely no light can be reflected or bounced back onto the object. So here is where I'm, it looks very light here because it's next to the dark, but this is the white of the paper. This has a little bit of value to it. It's not going to be a level one, two, or three. This is going to be more like a level four or a five through here, but it's going to react like there's light coming from, from the table and bouncing back up. And I'm going to go ahead and sort of start to fill in this casted shadow at least a little bit so you can kind of get a sense of what this would look like in reality. So now I have that working for me. But the one thing that's keeping this from looking realistic is that I've got this big heavy contour line 
that defines where the sphere is from my negative space. So remember, positive space is the object, negative space is the air around the object. So something I like to suggest that students start trying to do is actually put some value in their negative space. So I'm gonna take just my HB pencil and I'm gonna come through my negative space and I can let that value change. So I might have it a little bit darker right here where it starts to make an edge to the sphere and I'm gonna cross direction so that I sort of fill in some of those light spaces. It could get lighter as I come over here so I might change my pressure might not use as heavy of a pressure so that I can let that area kind of get just a smidge lighter in its value. I could leave the whole thing dark. I just want to have a variation of value from the objects dark. So as I do this, it starts to eliminate the focus on the contour line. And it starts to let the contrast of the values, the highlight and the shadow, play against each other. And I'm going to go just a little bit darker in this top corner. So as I kind of keep bringing this down, I'm going to take it to this line, kind of like the line of the back edge of the table. Even if you don't see a line, if you're drawing objects at your desk or at a table, you can always establish a sense of a ground line way in the back far off of your object, but just make sure that it cuts through the same level. You don't want one side to be up high and the other side to be down low. You also want to make sure that you've got a little bit of space for your casted shadow. If you have a ground line that cuts through a casted shadow, it's going to make this casted shadow look awkward and odd. So if you take a look, um, maybe a little bit of a tighter, closer look, I think you can notice that I'm going a little bit darker in my negative space value here and it's kind of just transitioning and light lighting lightening up sorry as I come over to the right side of us I hope you learned a lot from our tutorial today do keep in mind it's all about using the pencil the grip the heel end of the pencil that overhand grip and this trusty little kneaded eraser Try not to do a lot of finger smudging or taking a Kleenex and wiping that Kleenex in there. You're going to pick up a very different texture on the paper and sometimes the oils from your hands will make it much more difficult to pull off darker areas with this kneaded eraser. So do try to control your drawing with your pencils. I hope you learned a lot. I hope your spheres came out great. And maybe I'll see you in my drawing class next year.